All right. Hey, guys. It is Wednesday, September 25th. Bitcoin is at um, 80, sorry, 63,800. Got ahead a little bit ahead of myself there. Um, and uh, this, this video will cover what I call the new standard model for Bitcoin. Um, and what do I mean by standard model? Well, I think we're in a position right now where uh, a number of us quants, and I will throw myself in that mix, but uh, I would completely single out Giovanni, Stephen Perinode, uh, Plan C, Sina, um, have all, we've all kind of coalesced around this model, which is a model that incorporates the power law, which incorporates liquidity as a driver of price, which includes halving cycles as a determinant of price, and which has a model of volatility, a model of adoption, a model of how this thing could evolve into um, an S-curve uh, via a Weibull, fun Weibull function. And, uh, and I really think that this is a very cohesive model now that we're, we're starting to get to. And I really feel like it's not a stretch to call this thing the standard model um, in the same sense as we have a standard model now for particle physics. Um, so, you know, let's talk about the standard model and let's start with liquidity, right? Because the most, in a day-to-day -day basis, I think the thing that could drive the most price is liquidity. And what do I mean by liquidity? Well, broadly, I mean money supply, M2, right? Uh, and I think, you know, there's a lot of things that are creating liquidity. M2 is a good basis for it, US M2. But, you know, uh, there's been different ways of measuring global liquidity. And Michael Howell was on uh, with us uh, yesterday and you know did an amazing job with this um you know his analysis of liquidity and so i just want to single out michael and i want to single out this concept of liquidity that really kind of was born in the late 80s at solomon brothers uh which was really the premier uh, institution for research on interest rates on bonds and and the largest bond trading operation in the world at that time. And, uh, you know, Michael was at that firm. I was at that firm uh, on the trading side. And uh, a little later, Josh Mandel was at that firm. And, of course, my friend David Weil, who I subsequently left Solomon to trade with at Greenwich, was at that firm. So... Uh, we have this history of being at Solomon Brothers in the bond world at a time when Solomon was the king of the bond universe. And uh, the research coming out of Solomon Brothers and the bond market research group it was led by Henry Kaufman and the bond portfolio analysis group that was led by Marty Leibowitz was by far the best in the world. And, uh, and I, this is not a stretch to say that. So we have... We have this this beginning of a theory that starts with money supply. And I think one of the things that Michael Howell said in the last video that really resonated with me is really because of all this money printing, um, we're now, the main thing is refinancing the debt, right? Because the debt has become such a huge uh, number uh, that the cycles all around, revolve around refinancing the debt. And these are tend to be actually measured as 60 month or five year cycles. And where the, the five year number comes is that um, the average maturity of the debt is about five years. Um, so, you know, we've got this five year uh, phase to roll over the world debt. Um, and of course the U S is, you know, at the forefront of that with, uh, you know, $30 trillion in debt. Uh, that is being issued at different maturities. Now it's being issued really at the short end, but it has an average maturity of five years. And, um, 
And as Michael said, the, the real goal of the real mandate of the Federal Reserve is not to cut on inflation, cut protect against inflation or to protect against unemployment. The real mandate of the Fed, the unspoken real mandate of the Fed, is to make sure that the bond market operates and that the Fed, the U.S. government can tap the bond market for its issuance, right? So anyways, that's the liquidity side of it. Now, as Howell notes and in his studies, if you increase the liquidity by 10%, the gold will go up 10%, but Bitcoin will go up 40%. So uh, Bitcoin reacts in an, it's extremely sensitive to liquidity. And we, we saw that there was a, a fall in liquidity, about a 20% fall, a 10% fall in liquidity uh, from 19, 20, from 2020 to 2024 and uh you know the first phase of that caused a uh a real drop in bitcoin in 2022 and so you know that is more was probably more liquidity driven than having driven um it was really driven by the liquidity the federal reserve uh, tightening interest rates now and, and, you know, it goes back to another saying that was popularized by Marty Zweig about the same era. Marty was uh, an incredible uh, personality, and he was always on Wall Street Week and wrote some great books. And I actually subscribed to Marty's subscription service, so he had a, a newsletter. And it, was, it, was, it was great. And uh, Marty always said, don't fight the Fed. That was one of his rules. And in the same sense, Bitcoin, you don't want to fight the Fed. So now we have the Fed on our side. We have money printing. We know that as the Fed's pushing, right, Bitcoin's going 4x on that. So that's the liquidity side. Now we have the power law side, completely separate. The power law is really much more of a story of adoption. So we have this new technology, Bitcoin, which is about you know 1% global adoption right now. So 1% of the world uses Bitcoin as kind of their main savings vehicle right now. Um, I'm one of them. Uh, I hope you are as well. Um, if you have been using Bitcoin as your savings vehicle, you've been doing very well recently. Uh, so th- that 1% is growing right by roughly the time since the Bitcoin was invented in the Genesis block in 2009 till now, right? So it's been growing for 15 years. And the power law says that as it's growing, as that time since the Genesis block has happened, it's growing at roughly 5.7 power of that time, right? So it's growing at a very high rate, at a rate that is faster than an exponential rate of money supply growth. So money supply growth is growing at 10%. Bitcoin's growing at um, currently at about 45% compounded annual growth rate, right? So, you know, four times faster than the money supply is growing. And it's growing that way because adoption is growing and we're having adoption into this finite resource, resource. And because according to Metcalf's law, the, uh, it's becoming more useful. There's more people buying into this new money um, paradigm. Uh, And the result of all this is that we have this very, very high growth in Bitcoin price, but it's a high growth with high volatility, right? Now, really hard to understand, to see any rhyme or reason in this volatility when you look at it in just regular space or only if you look at the price in log space you really need to look at the price and time since genesis block in log space so log log space and then you can measure volatility and you see it's 0.3 which is actually very high (laughs) but not so high in log space right so and it's actually dampening a little bit so um 
we have this very good model now for Bitcoin prices, and let's just call it a historical model, right? We, we don't need to say it's a predictive model, but we know it's a historical model. The fit is excellent. You can't argue with this. Now, if you try to fit an exponential model to it, you will find the fit is not good. So this model fits the power law. It does not fit the exponential. Uh, the, the data does not fit the exponential uh, an exponential hypothesis. Actually, at this point, the data does not fit Plan B's model at all. So Plan B's uh, system is invalidated by the data. Um, and I really think we should just drop Plan B because Plan B was a very it was an early model, and a lot of people sort of perceived it as the standard model. They didn't think of it enough. They didn't analyze it enough. And I, I now think we can discard that model. And we really have this this power law model, which is the genesis of, of a really great model. Now, so if you add in the liquidity model and the power law model, and then we also take into account sort of historically the halving cycle, right, which was very significant in the first two um, in the first two bull markets of Bitcoin, right? In 2013, when the market, uh, it, when the halving happened, <laughs> and these halvings were very, very significant. They made an enormous amount of difference in terms of supply. Today, not so much, right? Um, we've mined 95% of all Bitcoin, and the happenings will matter for the miners, but they won't matter so much for Bitcoin holders because, you know, we're mining right now 450 Bitcoin a day. Uh, BlackRock just bought 2,400 Bitcoin, uh, BlackRock and, and Fidelity and the other uh, ETF but they bought 2,400 Bitcoin yesterday, right? So between Michael Saylor, the ETFs, this is not a question of um, who's, who's going to buy this extra mining uh, uh, supply. That, it, it's just no longer relevant. And that's just a bad model to have in your head that there's this finite little amount of new Bitcoin that is and, and you know, if that thing drops, it's going to make an enormous difference. It really won't, because if we're mining 450 Bitcoin a day right now, if we drop to uh, 225, which we will next happening, uh, it's not going to make that much difference. Those 200 Bitcoin a day are not going to make a world mountain of difference. Um, so there will not be a supply shock. But there may be a liquidity, <laughs> a liquidity shock worldwide, and there probably will be in five years because uh, we'll probably go through another liquidity cycle because we always tend to do that. And, uh, and so, you know, I think liquidity cycles will continue. Happening cycles, will probably not, if I had to guess. And, of course, we have this power law of adoption, et cetera. So put all these things together. <coughs> we now have a very consistent model of Bitcoin. We have a model with an R-squared of 95%. We have a great understanding of liquidity cycles. We have a great understanding of why Bitcoin is growing. We have a, models of adoption. Um, and again, I want to thank out Giovanni, first of all, for discovering this, uh, for discovering the power law. I want to point out uh, Stephen Paranaud for his work on applying the power law to gold, and for building up this Weibull model for an S-curve. Now, again, the, the crew is not 100% um, uh, uh, in agreement that we are going to see in a, a Weibull S-curve, but it's an interesting model because at some point the Bitcoin price sort of exceeds in a power law, it sort of exceeds all um, all the value of all resources on earth. Now, it may still do that, or it may sort of sort of kind of create a mess right now, but we are in the early stages where it's, the Weibull S-curve 
is essentially a power law and will be for the next two decades. So we also have this now this timeline in this. What does this model predict? Because it models that don't predict anything are useless, right? So, you know, general relativity uh, famously predicted Eddington's experiment with the, uh, the bending of light around the sun could be measured, verified uh, general relativity. Um, now, what does the power law predict? Well, power law predicts that 10 years from now, more or less, we should hit around a million in terms of Bitcoin price. Now, we could hit 3 million, right? We could, we could undershoot it by only going to half a million, but it's very unlikely that 10 years from now we're going to be at 100,000 Bitcoin. Um, it's also pretty unlikely that we're going to be at 10 million Bitcoin. So give us a good range of Bitcoin. It tells us a little bit how long we have to go to possible hyper Bitcoinization. And that number tends to be 20 years. Um, so a lot of this stuff is a predictive model. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's a great, great model. I think there's still stuff that we don't know about the model. Um, you know, it's, it's great that a lot of people are do really digging into the statistics and the math, uh, and the economics, because I think, I think this is a great area of study. And I think it's, it's something that I'm glad to at least be part of a little bit, even if it's just bringing it to light and shutting, shutting this out and spreading this to the world. So. So anyways, that's that's what I would call the standard model. I think it's going to hold up over time. Um, and uh, yeah, that's my episode for today. A little longer than normal, 16 minutes. But if you like this video, you like our stuff, uh, please follow me on YouTube. Hit, hit the subscribe button. And then please visit uh, Bitcoin Brain Trust, Brain Trust BTC on Twitter as well, which is where all of us quants kind of hang out and we sort of put some research, not every single day, but there's going to be some good research and good videos there. So again, thank you very much for, um, for following me and uh, safe Bitcoining. <laughs>